Right, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to welcome you to the 20 th 2022 Rhind Lecture Series entitled Unearthing the African Diaspora to be presented by Professor Teresa Singleton. This event is being broadcast live on Zoom. For those who are here in person, please ensure that you have switched your phones to silent. And channeling my inner air hostess, if there is a fire alarm, it's going to be a real one, so please exit from that exit or that exit. Welcome to you people all around the world who are attending virtually. And feel free to let us know where you are by writing in the chat uh, box. And please note that, um, it, uh, as, as is normal, there will be no questions until after the last lecture. But for those of you who are watching on Zoom, you can put your questions in at any time during any of the lectures in the chat, and we'll um, endeavor to answer as many as possible on Sunday. Note that we ha will have staff selling books this evening only, but please pick up one of these lovely new catalogues, which includes codes to purchase books at discount prices online and with no postage and packing. And a link to the catalogue will also be made available to those who are watching online. This event would not be possible without our sponsors, AOC Archaeology, so thank you very, very much for your continued support of these prestigious lectures. It is a custom at the Rhind Lectures to begin with a brief personal memoir about Alexander Henry Rhind of Sibster, near Wick in Caithness, who endowed this lecture series. A. H. Rhind was born in 1833, son of Josiah Rhind, a banker in Wick, and was educated in the local Pulteney Town Academy at Wick and at Edinburgh University, where he read natural history and natural philosophy. He also attended lectures by Cosmo Innes on Scottish history and antiquities because of his strong personal interest in these subjects. He involved himself in the archaeological study of his native Caithness and in 1851 opened a number of chambered tombs, including those at Yarrows. In 1853, he investigated the Broch at Kettleburn, a report on which appeared in Volume 1 of the Proceedings of Our Society. The finds from the Broch were also presented to this society. Rhind, having been elected a fellow in 1852 and becoming an honorary mem member in 1857, aged only 24. His archaeological interests were far-reaching. For example, in 1851, he made an extended tour in Europe, visiting museums in the Netherlands, Denmark, Germany, Switzerland, Austria and Italy and he was subsequently called upon to advise the society on the organisation of the exhibits in, these, in its museum. Rhind had intended to proceed to the Scottish Bar, but in 1853, deteriorating health led him to move to the south of England, and from then on he only visited Sibster in the summer. Nearly every winter he went abroad to pursue his antiquarian interests in Egypt and, in later years, spent part of the winter in Spain, Algiers, France, Italy and Madeira. Rhind was a prolific donor of both Scottish and foreign antiquities to the National Museum here in Edinburgh, including many important items he discovered in Egypt. Also in Egypt, he acquired what is now known as the Rhind Mathematical Papyrus, which was sold after his death to the British Museum. The Rhind Papyrus featured in Neil McGregor's History of the World in 100 Objects and has been the subject of a learned treatise by the Belgian mathematician Professor Pequet, in which he has published some new biographical information about Rhind. Another mark of the continued interest in Rhind is that in 2006 he appeared as the lead character in the historical novel The Empire of Eternity by Australian author Anthony O'Neill, a fascinating mix of fact and fiction in which Rhind is sent to Egypt as a secret agent on behalf of Queen Victoria. In reality, Rhind was an active writer of papers, memoranda and letters. Concerning himself, for instance, in matters of antiquities and treasure trove, on which he published influential pamphlets in 1855 on British primeval antiquities, their present treatment and their real claims, and in 1858 on the law of treasure trove, how can it best be best adapted to accomplish, accomplish useful results? 
His magnum opus, the book on his work at Thebes in Egypt, was published in 1862, shortly before his death, with the title Thebes, Its Tombs and Their Tenants, Ancient and Present, including a record of excavations in the necropolis. Rhein died at Zurich in 1863, some 23 days short of his 30th birthday, and was duly buried in the fam family burial ground at Wick. Among his many bequests, he was very generous to our society, including the gift of his library of some 1,600 volumes, a sum of 400 pounds for excavation in northern Scotland, and the profits and copyright of his book on Thebes. In addition, he left the eventuated residue of his estate at Sibster to the society to endow the lecture series that still perpetuates his name. And so, since their inception in 1876, the lectures have enabled speakers to present, I quote, a course of not less than six lectures on some branch of archaeology, ethnology, ethnography, or allied topic in order to assist in the general advancement of knowledge. And if you want to find out more about Rind, there, there are articles in, in our proceedings. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce a Professor Singleton to you. Teresa is a professor of anthropology at Syracuse University in New York in the States and the Pitt Professor of American History and Institutions at the University of Cambridge 2021 to 22. She was also a curator of historical archaeology at the Smithsonian Institution 1988 to 2000. Her areas of expertise are African diasporae, slavery and plantations, museums, the southern United States, and the Caribbean. Her most recent book, Slavery Behind the Wall, was published in 2015, and in 2014, the Society for Historical Archaeology awarded her the J.C. Harrington Medal for her lifetime contributions to archaeology. So it's my very great pleasure to invite Professor Singleton to deliver the first Rhind Lecture, Overview of African Diaspora Archaeology. Over to you. Thank you for inviting me to the lecture, to, to this lecture series. And I didn't know much about it. And when I got the invitation um, from Simon, uh, I think I read it very quickly and didn't realize it, I would be giving six lectures. I thought I was going to be one of six lecturers. And I said, oh, no. And then when I reread it, I because something about it said, well, what, what does he mean? This will give me more time to talk about my work if, <laughs> if I'm only going to be giving an hour lecture. And then I went and reread it, and, I was, and then I realized I was going to be giving six lectures. And I said, oh, no. Do I even have six lectures to give, you know, topics to give? But, but anyway, um, actually, since I've been in Cambridge, uh, the other Pitt fellow, um, who's a historian, we spent a, a couple of hours and, and you know, thinking about what kinds of topics um, that I, I could, could give or what different projects to, to include. Um, to begin, I'd like to talk about the archaeology of the African diaspora. Uh, first, defining what uh, diaspora is, I mean, some, many of you probably know, but um, recently when I did give a talk on the African diaspora, someone said, well, what exactly is a diaspora? And um, this definition that I use um, is more of a traditional one. I think today we talk about a, a lot of people, almost any migration is a diaspora. But um, traditionally, it really is a, a type of or a form of migration, one that's either uh, forced or induced. It could be voluntary, but usually when it's voluntary, the idea would be that there's some overwhelming uh, push for the community to begin migrating. Um, uh, second criteria is that uh, uh, the, the person or the group, or I shouldn't say the person, the community experiences some sort of alienation in the host or receiving country. So in other words, they are not necessarily welcome or they're put in a, 
uh, subordinate uh, position in the host country, and, and that endures for a long time. So if, if the group ultimately uh, mixes or becomes part of the dominant culture, then they, they're no longer um, thought of as still being part of a diaspora or having been a diaspora if they're able to merge into the, uh, uh, the main society without um, any issues. And then uh, collective memory or consciousness plays a part in cultural production. And then finally, um, there's exchange with other groups of the diaspora or, or of other diasporas that are related or either with the homeland. And I like using these, um, even though it's a very traditional definition, I like using it for the African diaspora because I feel like all these um, criteria are pertinent. But for other groups, you know, it may not be all five, but it could be, you know, at least one or more. Um, then I want to just briefly uh, talk a little bit about the uh, slave trade, or not so much talk about it, but illustrate it. And uh, this map just sort of shows various places where Africans came from and the percentages. It may be difficult to see. I, perhaps the people online will be able to see this map better than the ones that, that are here. But uh, it was a slave trade that lasted close to um, 500 years, and so, um, so therefore we're talking about you know, millions of people. And then this, just, this next slide just sort of illustrates where people were coming from. So the, the homelands or the areas, uh, these are really the departure the points. They were, the people themselves were were further in the interior of, of Africa. Um, but uh, these are the departure points. And as you can see, the uh, majority came from West Central Africa, but these other areas were also uh, very important as, as well. And, and in some places and at different times, you have uh, certain areas, certain uh, disembarkment, I'm, I'm sorry, not disembarkment, but uh, where, the, where people came from ended up yeah, disembarking in um, some places in, you know, in, in concentrations. And then this uh, next slide just sort of gives the percentages of the total number of Africans that went different places. And, People are always, our students, um, when I teach a, uh, talk about the slave trade in any of my courses, they're always sort of amazed that at the bottom, the United States only got approximately 4%. And some students will always say, well, you've got to be wrong. You know, look at how large our African American population is today. And I point out to them that, yeah, it was, yeah, we have, a, uh, well, 13% of the population today is African American. But at the time, during the slave trade, the um, number of African peoples um, was, was much smaller than some other places. And, but it was out of natural increase that, that you had a large African population um, developing in the 19th century. But as you can see, um, Brazil and the Caribbean uh, actually together had, uh, had about 85% or close to 85% of the um, enslaved people to, to go to, to those two places. So what is African diaspora archaeology? Uh, this is relatively a, a new term, or maybe not new, but I, in terms of archaeology, I'd say it's new. We first started calling it 
the archaeology of the African diaspora in the mid to late 90s. But the study is at least a half century old and, and perhaps um, older than that when you look at uh, certain places. Um, it began in, the, in various places um, where there were just people interested in particular uh, sites. Uh, they didn't necessarily call it even um, archaeology of African people in the, Ameri in the Americas or anything. But the earliest study we know of, or at least that I am aware of, took place in Brazil. And then um, in Cuba and the United States uh, started doing, um, began investigations of slave quarters or sla enslaved people um, around the same time in the late 60s. And today, it seems to be one of the um, most fastest growing areas of study in uh, the archaeology of the modern world or historical archaeology, as we call it, in the United States. And I guess here in um, the UK and Europe, it would be uh, archaeology of uh, post the post archaeology of, of post-medieval um, life. And uh, the image of the Journal of African Diaspora Archaeology and Heritage is about 12 years old now. So it's definitely a very institutionalized um, research interest. Uh, so this slide basically uh, repeats what I just said about wh what were the earliest uh, studies. Um, the one in Brazil focused on um, slave runaways in a cave in southern Brazil. Um, the second um, oldest is a, a research on a, a free black woman um, who lived in um, Andover, Massachusetts. She was probably born a slave, in, or born enslaved. And um, when Massachusetts abolished slavery, uh, she then became free. And that site was studied in um, 1945. And then, as I mentioned already about the studies in Cuba and in the southern United States, they were, began around the same time in the late 60s. Um, but I thought I'd talk a little bit more about the Lucy Forster site. Um, it was excavated in 1945, but has since been restudied twice, first in 1978, then later in um, 2008. And um, like, Many of the enslaved people in the northern United States, when slavery was um, abolished, which it was, it was abolished state by state, or in some, I guess in the case, yeah, state by state, um, you know, at different times, like uh, Massachusetts was one of the earlier states, whereas New York State, where I live, Slavery wasn't abolished until um, 1828. And what happened is that a lot of times the enslaved person would end up, um, even after uh, uh, abolition or emancipation, people sometimes refer to, or some historians refer to the abolition of slavery in the North as first emancipation. Um, and some of the, uh, Enslaved people would continue to work for their former um, owners and, and be, continue to be part of their household. And that's what um, Lucy Foster was, that was her situation. And, uh, but when the, and then the family later moved to Andover, Massachusetts, and she um, eventually was able to, um, through her former owners and later employers, 
uh, they gave her some land and she was able to be um, somewhat independent at that point. And so the house, uh, what was excavated was her house site um, in Andover. And, and this is just, uh, the graphic there just shows some of the ceramics that were recovered from the site. But um, I want to just talk a little bit about the different kinds of studies that are examples of the kinds of studies that have been undertaken in, as part of the African diaspora. Um, plantation slavery is uh, certainly the majority of studies fall into that category. But we, there are also studies of um, run, slave runaways, that's people who fled slavery, and they're also referred to as maroons. These are um, usually people who fled slavery and started their own settlements. And actually, the project I'm trying to do now um, involves that kind of uh, relationship. I'll talk more about that on, on Sunday. Um, and then there are free blacks, people who were able to obtain their freedom um, through the legal structures, either through the, um, their former master uh, allowing them to, you know, paying either, well, sometimes they would raise enough money, which usually took a lifetime, to then pay for their freedom or they could be freed through the um, wills of, um, of their um, former master. But, but that usually meant that they wouldn't be free until you know, uh, he or she died. And then cemeteries are another area that's um, where that archeologists are doing increasingly more research. This doesn't involve excavating cemeteries I mean, there have been a few excavations, but this usually involves just trying to um, locate some of these cemeteries, because as I'll show you in some slides, you know, most of them are on, um, you know, if they, if they have markers, uh, it's, it's not always evident that that's the case. And then there were uh, the, another category of black town sites. These are towns that uh, free blacks or after um, the abolition of slavery founded towns, uh, and some of those have been excavated. And then also urban neighborhoods um, within uh, major cities in some cases. Uh, th those have received some attention. And then finally, um, industrial sites. This probably doesn't cover all the various sites that have been investigated, but these are some of the major uh, categories. Uh, so plantation slavery, I'm not going to talk a lot about this be today or t in this lecture because um, uh, the talk that I'll give actually after this one and um, the talk, one of the talks I'll give on Sunday focuses, uh, they'll, 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 those will be two case studies to deal with plantation slavery. But uh, this listing just includes some of the kinds of things that um, uh, studies, archeological studies of slavery have found uh, in terms of the kinds of activities uh, that are covered at, at slave-occupied sites. And um, one reason for just sort of mentioning these things is that you know, people, and including myself, I have to admit, when I first got into this field, I would say, I, I told the person who became my uh, academic advisor in graduate school when I first met him at a conference and he said, well, maybe I can get you interested in this slave archaeology. And I said, well, don't we know everything there is to know about slavery? I couldn't, at the time, I couldn't, couldn't imagine that archaeology could contribute to the study of slavery because I, you know, I had 
taken a couple of courses as an undergraduate, and I knew there was a abundant literature on the subject. But um, little did I know <laughs> that uh, I would end up focusing on that in graduate school at that time. But uh, this, I don't, I probably, I guess I could go through, well, I'm, I'm not gonna go through this whole list, but um, there are some, the following slides show you some of the um, areas or some of the findings in, you know, that, that are included on this list. Uh, first, uh, the production of pottery. Um, this, we don't find this everywhere, and the site that I will talk about tomorrow, Butler Island, I was disappointed that we didn't find anything like this, that is um, pottery that was made by enslaved people. Um, it's called Kelowna ware uh, because it's a locally made ware, or usually it's a locally made ware that was um, made during the primarily during the colonial period, uh, not entirely, uh, but it's found more on 18th century sites than sites that uh, date after the end of, at least in the United States, that end after the American Revolution. And of course, one reason for that would be because of the Industrial Revolution, and um, therefore there was just, you know, you could get inexpensive wares without um, having to, to make them. So, um, so the need may not, or at least that's one possibility, the need for making pottery probably uh, didn't exist to some extent um, as it did uh, prior to having um, uh, mass-produced wares and iron pots and um, that, that sort of thing. Um, also, uh, an important finding, I feel, that archaeologists have been able to add to the written record and the historiography is what's sometimes referred to as the slave's economy or the um, independent production of enslaved people. And um, by this, we mean that um, enslaved people in addition to the labor that uh, they did on plantations, which was, you know, which was the main thing that they did do, um, they also were able to, in, in most slave societies, were able to at least have some opportunity, I guess you could call it, to make some money, um, or, or not so much make money, but do some production for themselves, whether this was like making pottery or selling um, foods from their provision gardens or, uh, or just be become involved in various kinds of exchanges. And so it's these objects here, uh, a, doll, a porcelain doll, a bone handle, a parasol handle, a domino, and a bead. These are more than likely things that enslaved people acquired through their own efforts, um, you know, from the, either through exchanges with storekeepers or something of that sort uh, that they're able to do. Uh, when people first began, um, doing the archaeological study of slavery, many thought that uh, these were things that were either provisioned by their um, enslavers, by their slave, by the slaveholder, or that, you know, some people assume that maybe they um, pilfered or stole some of these things. Um, but in most cases, and again, the historiography and other sources indicate that you know, they were engaged in their own uh, economy um, where they were uh, buying, producing ex and exchanging, um, involved in exchange to, to get some of these items. And um, 
particularly in the Caribbean, this is, has been well documented. Uh, this is an image showing a slave market in Antigua, but there are similar markets in uh, the United States as well, um, and, and particularly in um, certain places in South Carolina and in uh, Virginia. And uh, these markets were run by, um, or the primary sellers oftentimes were, were the enslaved people. And as you can see in this image, which doesn't look that great on my screen, <laughs> Um, there, you know, both black and whites were involved in the markets, you know, so the planters and um, other um, white residents on these islands, they were purchasing produce and other items um, from the enslaved people. And enslaved people would also be buying things like uh, the pots that, um, that you know, either enslaved people uh, made. Um, another thing too has been um, some idea or we're, we're beginning to learn a little bit more about uh, some of the uh, spirituality and um, religious beliefs of some of the enslaved people. Um, here you, these are just um, um, artifacts uh, that have turned up at a number of different sites, these coins with a pierce hole in them. And uh, their oral testimony um, in the United States, at least, that uh, talks about how these were worn. Um, in this case, you see someone wearing it by an, on their ankle, but also maybe just wearing it uh, strung on the, um, around the neck. And, you know, they were purchased, I mean, they were worn for various reasons, uh, some to, for, for um, folk medicine, I mean, as a way to prevent certain uh, ailments like rheumatism or something of that sort. And then in addition to amulets, we also find, I mean, or in addition to something like the Pierce coins, we've also have found uh, other objects, uh, horseshoes being placed at a, a door opening, um, uh, uh, references to doorknobs being used for various uh, purposes. So these are like everyday objects that, um, when archaeologists first began doing some of this research, you know, they just wondered, well, well what is this? You know, why is this here? But, um, so, and so had, didn't really think much of it, but we're finding after going through some of the oral testimony um, that in fact some of these objects were used as um, charms or, or at least were tied to the belief systems of the enslaved people. And then a, a more recent, uh, or very recent finding, I, I think it's only been about two years, that an ancient uh, DNA study was done of a pipe, uh, the white clay kaolin pipes that was recovered from a slave quarter in Maryland, uh, in the state of Maryland. And um, it was determined that the pipe was um, last, well, the person who smoked it was, a, was female, and that um, uh, her ethnicity was identified or tentatively identified as being uh, Mande which is an ethnic group um, that, at least today, lives in um, Sierra Leone in, in West Africa. And then I mentioned, uh-oh, yeah, I mentioned uh, slave runaway sites. 
this is just a slide sort of depicting the various kinds of runaway sites, uh, a cave site in Cuba. And in, in the Caribbean, generally, a lot of the, uh, or several of the sites that have been identified as being associated with slave runaways have been found in caves. And um, most of the caves only have a few artifacts. Uh, so it's suggested or proposed that they probably were there only for a short period of time, hiding out. But there have been other caves, um, like one of my um, present day advisees, he, he's, he's Cuban and he excavated a site, I guess about 10 years ago now, 10 or 12 years ago, where um, it looks like the, it was a huge cave and looks like that it was occupied. It's not this cave, but, but another cave that he excavated that um, apparently was occupied, or at least there are lots of artifacts suggesting that it was occupied for, for a long time. And then the next image is a layout of a Brazilian um, maroon site in Brazil. Slave runaway sites are called quilombos, and this is um, uh, an archival, this was in the archives showing the layout of one. Um, I guess you're wondering, well, who, how, how did that happen? But the people who, um, the slave catchers or whomever uh, that were after or in trying to destroy uh, these settlements, um, they kept, a, in, well, in Cuba, they kept very extensive diaries. And in this case, um, in, this, in Brazil, uh, someone obviously tried to map what the quilombo uh, looked like. The, um, what's interesting is that they're showing sort of the um, way in which it was defensive. And, and that's a characteristic found of, of, among a lot of these uh, sites is that they um, have some sort of palisade or, or something, or sometimes they just use natural protection of, of stone uh, to, to um, you know, place their, their settlements. And then uh, this is just a, a artistic rendering of um, someone illustrating runaways in Great Dismal Swamp. The Great Dismal Swamp was a big area in uh, North Carolina and Virginia uh, that was a place where enslaved people ran to, as well as other people um, at later time periods. And some, some excavation has been done at Great Dismal Swamp. And then this other uh, image is just sort of showing, well, it really is, it was supposed to be showing the site of Nanny's Town, which was a maroon, 18th century maroon settlement in, um, um, in Jamaica. And then free people of color, uh, again, there are free people who were free during the time of slavery. Um, William Johnson was, was a um, enslaved person who was freed by his, um, his slave owner. His slave owner, he was in Mississippi, but his slave owner went over to Louisiana to uh, free him at the time. And um, because it was more difficult to free someone in, in Mississippi when, when he was, um, when, when he decided to um, give him his freedom. And he was able to build a successful business as a barber in Natchez, Mississippi. And um, one thing he did was to keep diaries um, that documents the social life in Natchez at, at the time. And his house was at, the house was excavated back in the 70s, but the um, house museum, I don't indicate it here, but it's now part of a, a national 
Park Service uh, Park uh, that includes a number of sites um, in, in the Natchez um, area. And then um, African American cemeteries and grave markers. Um, this is just showing you a variation. Um, the first one, uh, the head, uh, it's a headstone and footstone at a uh, plantation outside of, or not, I should say outside, in Virginia, Hickory Hill. And um, as you can see, if you have, it's easy to, to not, if, if you didn't know that it was a cemetery, um, you, I mean, you wouldn't necessarily know that, that it would be, except, you know, like people who have learned that uh, some of these older um, African American cemeteries actually have just um, field so stone or quartz or some other kind of, of rock um, to indicate where the burials are. And then uh, the, the two um, grave markers, um, tombstones in the middle. Um, what's interesting about these, this wasn't an African-American cemetery. Uh, this was from a, a Presbyterian uh, cemetery. These were individuals, two individuals um, who had, well, they actually lived a long life. Want the, the, the woman, uh, Ambo, the uh, cemetery, I mean, the tombstone that's darker, uh, she lived to 100, and then Caesar in the, the white uh, uh, tombstone, or the lighter color tombstone, um, he apparently lived over 100. But what's um, the archaeologists that talked about these two grave markers and others in the cemetery, in this cemetery and in others, is the fact that um, you know, they lived all their lives, they were born in slavery, lived all their lives um, uh, with the same you know, slave owner's uh, family. Uh, this is from New Jersey, so again, as I pointed out about Lucy, how there was this practice of once um, slavery was abolished, a lot of times the um, African, free African Americans really didn't have any other options, so they continued to work and live with their uh, slave owners. And these epitaphs sort of emphasize their faithfulness and servitude, and you know, sort of just reinforce their subordinate status, you know, even in in, in death. So, um, so this this was sort of the point that the uh, archaeologist was who was studying these various cemeteries that this was something he found that at this one and I believe some others in uh, New Jersey. And then this last one, or the one that's on uh, with the clock, uh, this is a cemetery that's um, Behavior Cemetery on Saplo Island, which is on the uh, a Sea Island, I mean, or a Berry Island off the coast of Georgia, which I'll be talking more about uh, in my second lecture. And, um, but anyway, what's interesting is, is, are the grave goods. And it looks like the grave marker was um, whoever inscribed it. Uh, you know, anyway, I guess it's more like folk, folk art in, in this case. And then this, this is just another slide showing how just field stone is frequently the way in which slave cemeteries um, are identifiable above surface, above, I mean, yeah, above the ground surface. And so it's um, been difficult. It's, it's not easy necessarily to, to identify them if, if you aren't aware of, of the fact that, that uh, they were marked by uh, field stone. 
And then another example of a um, type or category I mentioned about how uh, African American neighborhoods have been investigated. Um, this one is Seneca Village in New York City, um, where you now, we now have, which is now part of Central Park, and it had been a thriving uh, community um, in the, from the 1820s to about the um, 1856, and when um, the city wanted to create Central Park, what they did was um, declared the land through eminent domain, and um, so the people, you know, had to were displaced and had had to move. Um, the whole project is is very interesting. A lot of people had no idea in New York City that there had been this neighborhood, or um, in, until uh, two archaeologists, I, I believe one is at one was at Columbia and the other at. Um, uh, City University in New York, uh, they were the co-principal investigators of the project, and they had a really difficult time getting permission to excavate in Central Park, but uh, finally uh, they were able to do it, and I've met people who, you know, just uh, particularly African Americans who were just thrilled to hear about this, um, this history that, that just really had been um, lost. And then a, another um, town that's really more of a multiracial town, and, and even Seneca Village was also multiracial. Not all of the people, I mean, it was predominantly African American, um, but later you had um, immigrants to New York um, white uh, European immigrants moving into the neighborhood as, as well. But uh, Frank McWhorter, he was a free black man in Illinois, and he founded the town of New Philadelphia, Illinois, in 1830. And um, he, uh, it, there's a publication by Paul Shackle on it, on the study of it, and uh, the map shows sort of the lots. And he had this vision of selling, you know, he, he uh, while a lot of, again, you had a, a majority or at least a, a large number of African Americans, he wanted it to be a multiracial town, so he sold uh, lots to um, other people as well. Um, and again, this town ends up dying primarily because of uh, railroad construction, um, which left it, the, it did, the town continued, but once the railroad came in, um, they didn't have the same source or same access to um, the kind of economic life that uh, they were developing. And then the, um, in industrial sites, uh, there haven't been many industrial sites that have sort of focused on African American um, participants. Um, but the Edgefield District in South Carolina uh, made a particular kind of pottery, a uh, stoneware, and it, the pot you see there, uh, it, it has its alkaline glaze. It's well known, to this, this uh, particular pottery being produced in um, Edgefield, South Carolina. And, and a lot of the potters uh, were enslaved. And the f most famous one is uh, Dave Drake. He um, made these huge pots. Um, I believe there's one when I worked at the Charleston Museum, they had one that was, I, I, I was trying to find out what was the actual number of gallons, but I think it was like 30 or, or 30 or 40 gallons, so it's, you know, it's huge pots. But the other thing Dave did was 
He also worked as a typesetter for the local newspaper in Edgefield, The Bee. And so he, all of his, not all of his parts, but many of his parts, he writes a little poem or a little um, thing on, on it. Uh, of course, my favorite um, thing that he said, said on a, on a, a pot was, um, I made this pot, Dave, you know, so he, he was determined, I, I think he recognized his legacy and wanted to, wanted to make sure that people knew who made, who made his, um, who made the pots that he uh, made. But suppose, I was just reading, um, supposedly made as many as 40,000 pots. So, but I don't think all of them are actually signed. Oh, I didn't, oh, <laughs> anyway, so I, I thought I had a final slide just giving acknowledgments to various people that must be on the other uh, talks. But, um, but anyway, that just gives you some idea of what kinds of things people are doing with the archaeology, the African diaspora. As I said, the field is um, growing. It, you know, it continues to grow. It's not just US-based, but um, every, um, I guess every, well, certainly in, in, in the Americas, uh, the Caribbean, Brazil, uh, in North America, uh, there's just so much work being done. And there's even some efforts um, where people are looking at the Eastern diaspora, not the, the Atlantic diaspora is what I know, but the, there's been some work trying to do um, on the uh, African diaspora in the Indian Ocean as well. So it's, it's a, a, a growing field and one that I feel like has provided a lot of information on um, people of African descent in the world that we just didn't know previously. So uh, thank you.